Okay, we are live. Well, welcome folks to our description of interoperability barriers and enablers. We're gonna be talking about connections and I certainly welcome this esteemed panel. We have payers, providers, patients, all of us representing different views on the interoperability problem. And for those of you who have been at HIMSS, you know that if we just had more regulation and the perfect standard, interoperability would just happen, right? That's what I've been saying for years. Yeah. Not. <laughs> <laughs> and so today, we're going to start with an introduction to this crowd. And then I got a couple of questions where I hope going to elucidate some of the next steps, the concrete things that you can take home that are going to accelerate interoperability and make us all successful. So why don't we start at the other end? Who are you? What do you do? Uh, my name is Bob Barger. I work for NextGen Healthcare uh, in interoperability or non-interoperability. Uh, main focus is really about how to connect external systems to supply providers with clinical data when they need it. Very simple. So you're a guy who doesn't believe in information blocking. You fired your chief information blocking officer, I'm sure. He only comes in two hours a day now. Good. Hey. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, Matt Curler, uh, Vice President Product Innovation for SureScripts. So I have responsibility for our record locator service and clinical messaging products, and happy to be here today. Thank you. I'm Jim Murray. I'm Chief Information Officer for CVS Men and Clinic. We operate a little over 1,100 clinics uh, all across the country. I'm Eric Kinnear, and I work for SSM Health in St. Louis, Missouri. We cover four states, um, hospitals, and clinics, and I'm responsible for our interoperability initiatives, everything from our Epic Care Everywhere to our HIEs to our record locator service implementation, things like that. Great. And uh, thank you uh, for having us here. My name is Peter Devault. I'm Epic's uh, Vice President of Interoperability. And so I work with all of our customers on their interoperability strategy, including SSM. I also sit on the Sequoia board. So Sequoia runs the eHealth Exchange and Carry Quality. And I'm also on the Carry Quality Advisory Committee. And John Holanka, my roles have been many. I'm in the CIO of Beth Israel Deaconess System, 450 locations, work on the state HIE, and ran the National Standards Committee four years under George W., six years under Obama, and no years under Trump. That's my goal. Please vote wisely. <laughs> so let us raise the issue. And we'll start with Peter. We'll go back to the other direction. What do you see as the real barriers in 2016 to interoperability? Where is it that we can really make a difference? So largely today, the barriers are not technical. There still are some technical barriers. Uh, largely what we see as barriers are governance and, and trust, which go hand in hand. Uh, we have been able to connect all of our customers to each other because they all have a single relationship with us. That's not true once we start going outside of the EPIC community. So our customers are connected to 550 some non-EPIC sites. That's 550 separately brokered negotiations between our customers and those organizations. I think things like carry quality that's uh, promising a, a trust fabric that can be adopted between many different networks is going to be an enabler uh, to overcoming that barrier. Um, and then once we get all the pieces connected, we have to start focusing more on achieving semantic interoperability. So we need better reference terminologies for things beyond medications and problem listing allergies. So let me just amplify what he said. So in your community, Joe's Endoscopy Shack has opened up for business. And oh, there's a medical license in play. Would you send your data to Joe's Endoscopy Shack? Who knows? They could be putting it on Facebook or selling it to Pfizer. And so who do you know is, you're going to trust? Who is going to behave per whatever business associate agreement or participation agreement is the standard of care in the community? And this is tough. So either you do like Care Quality or Epic has done, and you build a community of users who agree to a certain rules of the road, or in Massachusetts, what we did is we created a health information exchange from the state level, and we don't call them Rios anymore, Chins, health information exchange, that's the cool term for today. And they basically have a series of participants who all sign their lives away in participation agreements, so you know if you go from point A to point B, the data will have integrity and will not be misused. You get away from the bilateral negotiation, which is an N squared problem. 20 people talking to 20 people is 400 agreements. It's not scalable. So trust, move on to the next idea. 
Yeah, so to build on what Peter is saying, you know, I think that one of the other barriers that I see working in a state that requires authorization is that as a nation, we need to adopt something of a trust from a consent model. Either we're going to do consent or we're not going to do consent. Right now, every state, every local, every facility has a decision they can make as to whether they're going to require patient consent for data information exchange. And it causes not only, I really see that as one of our barriers, which is, first of all, you have to educate all of your patients. So the time and energy that goes into educating your staff to be able to collect those consents and inform your patients uniformly and consistently but then also the technology that goes into needing to manage the different solutions. We cover four states. Every state has a slightly different take on the consent model, what data is required, what data must be protected, and we really need to unify that so that we can actually move forward more quickly in a way that reduces that particular barrier. Um, I do think, just to coin what Peter was saying, care equality is gonna be a great way to help build trust between technologies. But I think as a, a nation and a community, we need to build patient trust. And by unifying that and educating our patients across the board, that will help our patients trust the process as well. And so to this point of building common policy, we have 56 different states and territories, which means we have 56 different laws. And in Massachusetts, where I live, on one side of the border, the consent is opt-in. On the other side of the border, the consent is opt-out. On one side of the border, HIV tests can't even be sent with opt-in consent unless you consent to view on every view. It's insane. it's insane. And so, of course, the question we want to ask is, is a private sector organization going to help us rationalize these policies? Does there need to be more regulation? Does there need to be a framework, a guideline for governance? I don't know that there's a simple answer to that. I certainly can tell you, because we had a brief discussion before the panel, all of us are slightly fatigued by the growing number of regulations we have to comply with. So I think we're maybe there with frameworks and guidance, but more meaningful use stages, maybe not. Barriers, thoughts? I'll, I'll uh, respond to, to, to Peter's initial point on trust, and that's certainly been a challenge for us as well and we've become members of care equality and certainly have agreed to those rules of the road but getting getting beyond the four states and we operate in over 33 states those conversations that you talked about John 20 people talking to 20 people a lot of times the first question out of our mind out of our mouths is what does the state say what will the state let us do and how can we move that information and move it in a safe way the technology is there the standards are there the regulations certainly are there. We spend a lot of time talking about them, and that is one of the, the time sinks that we spend, or that, that eats up a lot of resources in getting through, and also maintaining that going forward. Once you get it in place, the state and the regulation can sometimes be a living, breathing thing that we need to keep up with, so making that scalable is a huge challenge to us, where we want to talk to everybody. And so let me give you an example of scale. So I mentioned the Massachusetts Health Information Highway, or HIE, wants to connect all of our various stakeholders together with trust. Well, it turns out I strongly believe, and this is not an endorsement for any company or service, that Minute Clinic will actually rule the world. Because you probably want to get care close to home with free parking, with no waiting in 15 minutes, as opposed to driving four hours, paying $40, and maybe you will get care coordination, maybe you won't. So what we said is, we want to connect every minute clinic in the country once. And all we had to do was negotiate one agreement with one point of trust, and now every minute clinic in America is connected to the Massachusetts Highway, and we have the exchange from our 500 participating organizations with minute clinic bidirectionally. That's an example of scale. But the, why didn't you do that all over the country, John? I don't know why you limited yourself to Massachusetts. Yeah, well, you know, Massachusetts is a little strange place, and it's, we're all nonprofit and we love each other. Not so much everywhere else. Barriers, thoughts? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. We're having this conversation around consent and the state regulations, and, and SureScripts brings an interesting perspective here with our experience in e-prescribing. And if you go back 10 years and look at where e-prescribing was, the, the regulations in the states, not all states accepted e-prescribing, we had to work with every single state to get them to the point where we could have this national ecosystem of electronic prescribing. And frankly, that's something that we are going to have to do with health information exchange as well. So there, there is a long road ahead of us, um, but it's absolutely a road that if we partner together, 
uh, we can make a difference and change those laws for the, the betterment of everyone here. Very good. And certainly, as I look at the connectivity I have today, 96% of the pharmacies in the state of Massachusetts are connected to any prescribing network. And there was incredible, I mean, I have to give the government due, motivation to get people on e-prescribing because there was a bar set that said, you got to do it. And I think, you know, certain enablers like building some incentives to comply with certain moving forward tasks will help interoperability. Certainly. We hope, however, as we move forward, we'll be given an outcome to achieve as opposed to a prescriptive means of doing it. So, for example, on e-prescribing of controlled substances, we don't tell everybody you must use a thumbprint. We say, here are a set of guidelines. You, you like thumbprints? Great. You like retinal scans? That's okay. If you like two-factor authentication with tokens, that's okay too. Your choice. Achieve an outcome. Here's some rules of the road and give you flexibility. And I think, as you say, with interoperability, if we're given a goal, care coordination, you will be paid when the data arrives at the next provider of care We'll get action. Yeah. Barriers. Well, it's tough being last because you've hit all the key points. <laughs> oh, right? there's more, there's more. Uh, there is more. Uh, and I'll take a different approach and I'll tell you that, you know, in a one week period, I saw one article that said home health care devices do not improve patient health in a six month study. And a week later, I saw another article that said home health monitoring increases patients' health. So I think what's been lacking over the years is metrics that show the value of interoperability to the provider and to their patient base. And that's been missing. I mean, we're starting to see some of it, but from the position of if you're going to share data and you're going to go through the little bit of extra effort, it should take a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit. There should be volumes of metrics that show the benefits to the patient's health based on that. So anything that we can do, when we can start showing these metrics, providers, I'm not a provider, I know you are, there's a few others here, you'll demand it. It won't be a question of, boy, it'd be nice to have that. It'll be, I demand that, and if I don't get it, I'm going somewhere else, so. And the reason there's ambiguity in whether home health devices help or hurt, remember, 50% of everything we were taught in medical school is wrong. We just don't know which 50%. So there you go. <laughs> and so this point that you make of metrics, this is quite key. So I was asked yesterday by the health minister of Japan, what are the key performance indicators in the United States for interoperability? <laughs> okay, hey panel, yeah, what, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, so how about the numerators and denominators of CCD exchange? That's pretty helpful. So here, here's a sack of garbage. <laughs> I've delivered it, check! <laughs> to me, you, interoperability has to be measured by the utility of the result. And that is, if you ask a doctor, you ask a nurse, you ask a pharmacist, were you able to deliver the safe quality care you needed to based on the data that had to be present across multiple sites? Oh yeah, I did. In fact, goodness happened. So Epic, Cerner, Meditech, NextGen, many companies have come together with class, again, not an endorsement for class, but class said, we are not going to measure numerators and denominators. We're going to actually survey 100 Epic clients, 100 Next Gen clients, and ask the doctors and the nurses, did they achieve the result they needed with the tools they were given? And if so, we'll see a Yelp-like report suggesting that they were interoperable. And I think that's a really interesting, good forward-looking metric. Some of the other metrics, just to kind of comment on this, because we've been really focused on, you know, where do we spend our money on interoperability? So there's a lot of options out there, there's a lot of choices, and in order to decide, you know, which technologies are worth it, you have to look at the economies of scale, right? So what types of connections am I getting for the money that we're putting out? So if I'm going to look at it, I want something that gives me the most connections, the most efficient way, that removes the most middlemen, but that provides me with the most valuable information. So when we looked at it, we've been monitoring metrics on the information we can reconcile. The data comes to me in a way that I can reconcile it and make it a permanent part of my record, and I don't have to just keep viewing it in a view-only format. So last year, just in the half a year that we re-energized our efforts around this and educated just those in our Missouri area, we reconciled over 560,000 medications that we didn't previously have on our charts. 
Now, some of those are patients that are new to our system, right. but a lot of those are patients that were currently our patients. And by having access to this outside data, we now have 560,000 extra medications, 39,000 allergies. You think about that in a terms of preventing an error, that may be 39,000 opportunities to prevent an error to an adverse reaction to a medication. And those, those might be decent numerators for some metric of usefulness. Yes, absolutely. And so, you know, we hope to see that number grow next year because we have more users and we have more connectivity. At some time, it'll balance out because hopefully our charts are accurate right. you know, by the time we have all of that information. But that is a, that's a metric we're using to measure success as to, you know, is the information that we are getting usable? Are people taking action on the data they're getting and making it part of our permanent record? But the other point you mentioned is the economies of scale. So, right. and again, when we talk about care quality in the framework, the economies of scale are obvious. You, you, you're going to have one framework that you're going to use for everybody. And when you add in other large uh, organizations like a Shorescripts record locator service that says, all right, we're going to start with 250 million patients, and we're going to start with a million providers. Oh, and we're going to use this framework for everybody. It's one connection. It's one framework. And, it's, and it, it levels the playing field, I think, for everybody to, to move forward so you can get to the point where you've got meaningful data being exchanged so you can do the analytics for the metrics to show the benefits. And so he's mentioned this record locator service. And just so everybody who's listening recognize what that is, let me give you a case of my mother. So my mother broke her hip two years ago. She went to an emergency department. The emergency physician said, I need to reconcile your medications. She said, well, I take the red one, the blue one, but sometimes the green one. Well, where are your records? Well, they're in my primary care doctor's office. Oh, what is your medical record number and what is, is his direct trust address? <laughs> what are you talking about, right? And so the patients may, in some future interoperability state, carry their CCDAs on their phone and be the stewards of their data, and that's great, but my mother's 80, and she does not actually want to be the steward of her own data. She expects our healthcare system to know who she is, where her records are stored, if she has consented to allow that information to be retrieved, and then with some degree of accuracy, retrieve it when needed and insert it into the systems of record, for example, the ER she visited. So Peter, I'm gonna ask you this question. We've been talking about reconciliation. It's pretty hard to take external data, not knowing if the patient whose name may be Maureen Kelly, she's Irish, is the same Maureen Kelly you already have in your system. So how do you deal with stuff like that? So the entire question of interoperability is fraught with naive notions that people hold. And a lot of those people are in Washington, DC. For the, example. For, well, <laughs> I won't name names, but uh, there was this expectation that if we incentivize interoperability and we create a standard, let's call it direct, that all of a sudden interoperability would happen. What people didn't realize is that there's an entire ecosystem necessary for interoperability to happen. You could have a phone network, but if nobody has a phone book, nobody's going to be calling anybody, at least not meaningfully. Right. So we need provider directories. We need mechanisms for matching patients accurately and, and inspiring confidence that you've actually accurately matched the patient's record. Uh, part of those things are technology. Uh, part of it is learning as we go, what policies uh, work best. We've gotten really good at eliminating false positives on matches, which is great. We don't even know how far we have yet to go on eliminating false negatives. Right. Uh, so we need to take very seriously identifiers or mechanisms for determining who a patient is and whether it's the same as this patient for whom we have a record somewhere else. And not and that all we that already assumes that we know where to ask. So that's where the record locator service may come in. Uh, austerity is sometimes the mother of innovation. And in the absence of having a record locator service, we've gotten pretty good at making do with the information that we do have. We know a patient's address. We know the location of the clinic or the hospital that they're currently in. So we can make some educated guesses about where their records might be. A record locator service goes one step beyond that and says, definitely, this is where the patient's records are. So that's going to be a very interesting um, 
element of the ecosystem, one that we haven't really had before, I expect that we're going to see many record locator services over the next several years, some of them perhaps payer-based, uh, some of them national, like the SureScripts network. Wherever that data naturally lives, if we can expose that to technologies that are searching for a patient's records, so for a payer, or CMS is another great example, they know where the patients who are seen by the most providers, they know where they've been. If we could get that information from them in the form of a record locator service, for example, that would be a huge benefit. So yeah, Peter, thing, oh, oh please go ahead. ahead. One thing to add to what you're saying, that this notion of using data that already exists in the ecosystem in a new and innovative way, that's something that SureScript certainly feels passionate about. And if you look at what we're doing with our record locator service, it's a great example of that. We have access to all of this data. We've obtained the rights to use this data. And we're using it to provide that location information as part of this service. So it's, it's data that wouldn't generally be used for this purpose, but kind of repurposing it for this for the betterment of healthcare is certainly important. And I think your, your comment around payers is a good one as well. That, that's, I think, the next area where we'll see some evolution. It's, it's interesting to think about as we use this data that exists in the ecosystem today and the record locator service and other services out of payers might come up, the ecosystem is going to get much more complex and much more diverse. And we're going to have to sort through that again. We're going to have to get to the point. Now, trust comes in in a big way then. So the organizations like Carry Quality and others that can establish these rules of the road will, I think, help us get through that, but I think it's going to get more complicated before it gets simpler. I, I completely agree. I think there, one other naive notion has been that some, some, at some point there will be a single network that will connect everybody. Um, that's not true in any other industry. It's not going to be true in healthcare. There will, be, there will always be many networks. There will be new kinds of technology that's part of the ecosystem, and we have to adapt to that. Now, I've been told there will be a canonical database in the basement of the White House run by Donald Trump. I don't know what you're talking about. It's on somebody's private server. Hey, there you go. And Hillary's got an extra server, I hear. Um, so the point they're making is there's this ecosystem that has to develop. And as you're saying, I mean, the folks in the federal government were trying hard, but they did make some magical assumptions, which is to say, if you have a car, then you can drive. Oh, what about roads? Traffic signals, yes, stop signs, <laughs> right? And so the problem, of course, direct as a protocol is great if you have a contact list of every provider in your region that you would ever need to send stuff to. Oh, we don't have that. Or knew who your patients were unequivocally or had trust. And so what you see evolving, so SureScripts has a record locator service. Commonwealth trying to figure out you know, how it's going to create some of these enabling infrastructures. Direct trust, provider directories and certificates, Sequoia, equality, same sort of care quality, excuse me. So I think, as you guys are saying, there is a lack of infrastructure that has been built in the past. In 2016, that infrastructure is now coming into utility. And there will be several infrastructures. There will be a kayak.com, but there'll also be a TripAdvisor. And you know, that's okay. They each will have slightly different features and functions, and the market will decide. Now, I'm going to ask you guys a very controversial question because we are chatting about Hillary and Donald and a few other things. Do you think the government is the one to build all of this infrastructure out? Because you know what we need is digital certificates for every baby at birth. It's going to be great. That's our new healthcare identifier. Is it government? Is it private? Is it both? Well, I think it's important to, that the government know, and they, I think they see some of it, that it's already occurring in the private market. So Epic has their thing, you know, CVS, uh, Short Scripts. NextGen has its own record locator, you know, for its clients. So you've got these, these you know, other vendors as well. So if you can federate a small number, but you still get the majority, you've made the step. Uh, again, to have one network for everyone where everyone's on it and everyone's using it and everyone agrees to every rule is challenging, to say the least. But if you can take the core, the core pieces, here are the messages, here are the rules, here are the, here's the trust framework, and now working within that, you work together as a federated solution. And I, and I think that you can handle, you know, this, the problem is we always try to solve it, solve interoperability for the entire nation at once, as opposed to let's go with the, connect to the community first. Get your community where you're sharing the data and then move on, but it has always been all at once. So I think the private sector said, you know what, doesn't work, we're gonna go with the community-based, 
And now that we've got community-based, we're going to expand with a common framework across those communities, a common infrastructure across those that can connect to each other. And this is very well stated. So uh, I am of an age where I remember when I was a kid, about eight years old, I was riding my bike past a bank and this machine showed up outside the bank. And you know, you could go to that machine at that bank and get cash from your bank. But you couldn't go to a bank a block away. Oh, and then before you knew it, you could go a block away. And then before you knew it, you could go a state away. Before you know it, you can be in Japan, convert dollars to yen and get whatever you want. But we didn't solve the ATM problem for the world overnight. We started with your bank. Yeah, John, that's a key point. This, to, to be successful, we need to take incremental steps. They need to be very meaningful steps, but they need to be incremental. I think where we've gone sideways before is if we try to boil the ocean and do everything for everyone and, and really focusing in on some very key use cases, being successful with those use cases, solving the problems for those use cases, and then taking it from there is a, a good way to move forward. Now, do we have anyone from Congress sitting here? Okay, so I, I was on the phone with a couple of folks in Congress work. last week. I was, good, no. Um, and I said, guys, what is the definition of interoperability? These happen to be House members. And they said, every data element exchanged with every stakeholder for every purpose at no cost in zero time. <laughs> Perfect. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> and so what he was just saying is, start with some high value use cases. Get those under your belt. Once those are working, expand. So for example, with this Argonaut initiative, working on the fast healthcare interoperability resources or fire, we didn't start with 4,000 data elements in your data dictionary. I don't even know how many you have. 150,000. 150,000, okay. What we started with is a problem list, a medication list, an allergy list, your labs and your demographics. You know, it's not perfect, but it certainly gets you pretty far. And that use case was, care coordination. It wasn't every quality measure or every public health po you know, potential purpose. And so what I hope, and you know, want to hear more from you guys, is that if as a country we give action items to you, figure out the high value use cases, figure out the enabling infrastructure, and then select that private sector company that's going to fill the gaps. One thing I used to tell people, it doesn't come up as often anymore, they would say, we need interoperability, and I would say, no, you don't. You need to solve specific problems because they're business or clinical problems, and uh, there are solutions that either exist already or that we can develop, but interoperability as a concept is not what you need. You need to solve specific problems, so I completely agree with that. And of course, it's very often when I am talking about interoperability, they say, you know, the standards. That, that's the, we, we just don't have the standards. Now, I certainly love to hear you guys as you talk about enabling infrastructure, do we have to wait to 2020 until you know the next HL7 ballot comes through? Or do you think we kind of have the tools and the kit that we need to go forward? So I'd like to comment on that because I think that we have standards now and I think if everybody works together in the community to adopt them, that's great. And that's from a healthcare provider perspective what I'd love to see. What I think we struggle with, though, is different interpretations of those standards. So some of the standards exist, but one group takes the interpretation down this path and another down this path, and then as a healthcare provider, we're left with the result, which is information that we can't manage, we can't deal with it. I remember testing with one of our organizations and the same banana allergy kept coming in. Every time I queried, the patient's banana allergy came in. I'd add it to the chart banana allergy kept coming in because information wasn't uniquely identified in a way that once I took action on it was recognized as managed. And so I think that while there are standards out there, there still does need to be a realistic approach to applying those standards, to agreeing on how we're going to utilize those standards so that the end result is true usability for the end user. Agreeing, agreeing on how we use those standards I think is key too. We've had yes several examples with our miniclinic integration efforts where the interpretation of the standard, how I'm going to process the data coming in, is thought of a little bit differently and can cause uh, an error in the transfer when I'm expecting a data value because the standard says it should be there, but it's really an optional data value so I could skip over it. It's not that important. And as we worked with different organizations around the country, we found that so often 
that we had the framework, we had the piece there, but we had to interpret it the same way. We had to utilize it the same way uh, or it would fail. And so just as an example from Massachusetts of what you're saying, we have a great business case for achieving integration across our payers and providers. And where there was a business case, we together as a community created an implementation guide with zero optionality, right? And that, because optionality basically is your enemy. Every time you have an or, it means an and, right? You have to presume it, you know, it could be there, it may or may not, but you gotta engineer for it. And it took some time. And you may not, as people have said, achieve one implementation guide for the entire universe for every use case. But that's why a use case specificity is so important because you can't simply eliminate the optionality from a standard absent a use case in mind. Right? The standard right. exists to serve many different use cases. And so when you talk about reducing the optionality in a standard, you have to say, for what purpose? You might use uh, HL7 v2 for this very specific purpose and use a different flavor of that same standard uh, for a different purpose, right? The other thing I would say, John, is it, it's important that we don't stop innovating. So we have some standards. There's a lot that we can do today with those standards, um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue to move the ball forward with things like fire and everything else. And I, I think there's also a real opportunity for some organizations to bridge between those standards. So it's more about making sure that at least you can connect somehow and then kind of translate that to the way that somebody else needs to connect. So that person in the middle and that entity in the middle is a key part of this as well. So, so what he says is so important. I mean, we'll never be done. I mean, it's like working on security, right? You're never gonna be done. But it's to say at some point, it's good enough. And so, fire. CCDA with some constraints. Having provider directories, having record locator services. This is sort of the core of what we need to move data. Now I mentioned the word security because there's a lot of security in the news and you know recently I was asked, you mean you trust mobile phones to have patient identified data? And my answer is, well, if the FBI can't read it, I think it's probably okay. <laughs> and so I know all of you deeply respect the need for patient privacy and security is in fact a technical control that respects privacy. So as we build these networks of networks, any wisdom you would offer the crowd about security? Mm. Security is a problem that is faced in every industry. Similar uh, technologies, similar best practices can be used as they are in banking, as they are in the airline industry, as they are in government, in healthcare as well. We shouldn't try to develop healthcare interoperability specific security practices and, and standards. We should adopt the best practices that are already out there for other industry, industries. And I think that's what most people are doing. These days. And this is so very well said. So many of us have worked in healthcare standards <coughs> for 20 years, and we all know healthcare is totally different, absolutely different than banking and retail. Oh, we better have our own special approaches. It involves, you know, I have new tongue of bat, and ooh, and look, the moon. And, you know, in fact, we are now migrating to things like OAuth 2, OpenID, these standards that are strong and good enough for Amazon, Facebook, Google, and Netflix. And probably, I think we'll see over the next couple of years that as those standards become the common standards of industry, you'll get an ecosystem of apps, third-party plugins that are secure enough and good enough. And the policy guidance, which we'll get to next, from Devin McGraw, who now is writing the policies for Office of Civil Rights, are as follows. If a covered entity delivers to a patient over a secure channel using reasonable industry standards, the Office of Civil Rights will not create an enforcement action against that covered entity should the patient decide to spill the data to Facebook or give it to the Chinese, right? So we shouldn't fear giving the data to mobile phones, using a cloud, or using these common standards. OCR, of course, will keep us honest, but they're going to be reasonable. That's just one of many policies. So let me open up to the group. We're talking about technology, record locator, provider directory standards. What policy change do we need to ensure interoperability and better data liquidity? Thoughts? 
I would take it back to the conversation that we had earlier around consent and having a uniform ecosystem, which in some ways is a pipe dream, but I think it's something that we need to strive for, would make all of, all of our lives much easier. Right now, as we try to roll out services, all of us, nationally, um, every state is different, and that is just incredibly challenging, and at the end of the day, it really impedes progress. I would agree, Matt. I think consent is probably the number one thing that holds us back, not just from the technology, but from the workflow and putting it in front of the user as well. Training 1,000 registrars to educate your patients, and for you, I have no idea how many registrars, but the number of people that you have to educate about when you have to collect consent and how to deal with it, the legal overhead, the battles of dealing with negotiating between organizations on the different consent models, it's it's actually a very tremendous effort. Um, I agree that that's priority. I would add a little twist, and we talked about it earlier, and that's the implementation of the standards. So we require every every EP and every you know, eligible hospital to exchange a CCDA and to incorporate that data into their record, med, med allergies, problem list. Um, so what we don't have is a mechanism that when we have a different interpretation of an implementation of a standard, where do we go to solve that? Because we have good intent, and you know, NextGen says to Epic, yeah, well, we think it goes here, and we think it goes here. Well, we're both right if you interpret the standard, so we're both going to make it so we support, you support ours, we'll support yours. The next release is in 12 months. So we go to the government when we say we, miss, we don't understand as a vendor community this regulation and they make a ruling. Here's what we meant, here's what you need to do to be certified. So if anything, we could, we could get that type of a uh, help from the government to say we will be the body that it won't take a year to determine what's the right way or the wrong way. Bring us your interpretation. We will talk to the industry. We'll make a quick determination of here is the interpretation. And as you said, reduce or eliminate the optionality so that when you get past the consent pieces, you don't have the semantic interoperability issues that we've had in the past. So, so I, I, I would okay. sorry, disagree with you on who should actually solve that problem. I actually don't want government interpreting standards for me. I don't think they'd be good at it. There's already a mechanism for doing what we're talking about here, which is integrating the healthcare enterprise. That's yeah, but that takes a year to a year and a half to actually get a change proposal. How long would it take for government to do it? Well, that's my point. Is that there's this new thing that HIMSS is doing, right? Concert certification, where part of the appeal of that is they're going to have a board that's going to mitigate these for your certifications in a production environment, you run into an implementation issue, you can bring it to their advisory board, they will make a ruling and say, if you want to keep your certification, here's the ruling. So I don't disagree with your disagreement. It's kind of not interoperable, but you know. <laughs> uh, so you agree I'm, with me. Well, I'm still getting over how you guys got the same socks with different companies. Yes. But, but, the, but you're right. Is it the place for government? I, I agree it's not, but we don't have it today that can be done in a fast enough method to use in a production environment. So should it be the government? No, but I think the question was, what could they do? Well, how about get a private entity, say there's the private board that we're gonna support that's gonna mitigate the regulatory pieces, but the government's out of it, but we're gonna support it and tell you that's part of the regulation. So, you gotta do what they say. Bob, what do you think about a group like Carry Quality doing that? For I, not to create another organization, I'm but in. to use ones that are already I'm there? In. I think there should be something like that, and if there's not already, hopefully it's in the works. Um, right, and so I was going to try to build peace here, you know, and, and, and harmony is what I do. They set us this far. Apart. There you go. <laughs> in Massachusetts and New England, we created this New England Healthcare Exchange Network for the purpose of, say, taking the X12 standards, which have a lot of optionality, and agreeing that we would rapidly resolve disputes as a group working together, like Care Quality would, or Sure Scripts might, or etc. Because you say. There's lots of interpretations, but if I can be a broker, an honest intermediary, to bring these disputes to resolution quickly, that's probably going to be helpful. I have worked in government for almost 10 years. Government does some things well. Dispute resolution wouldn't be one of them. Uh, you know, I, I do worry that uh, in the days where I ran Hitspe, I was told by one of our standards groups, the standards are perfect. It's just your PhDs interpreting them that are dumb. Probably that's not so much the issue. So we've heard a bit about the need to have common implementation guides and dispute resolution, common consent policy. Now, again, we're not going to solve this today, you know, because drinks are happening soon. But in Massachusetts, as an exemplar of what we did, we did not look to HIPAA 
we looked to the Boston Globe, a very powerful regulatory entity, <laughs> and said, Boston Globe, how would you feel if we asked the patient how they feel about exchanging their data? And it wasn't that hard. It was it gave them a very, you know, couple of choices, educational materials written at the sixth grade level. And at the end of reading, they just checked a box. You know, I want this, I don't want that. They signed it and we were done. So in effect, and I know this is gonna cause a lot of angst, it was an opt-in approach. In effect, having a patient define their preferences, and by that, we now got their consent to do lots of great things with their data, and the Boston Globe loved it. So comments about your communities, your organizations, and consent models. Is there one you favor? Yes. Yes. Opt out. Uh, when we switched our network from opt-in across the board to each organization decides whether they're opt-in or opt-out, and eventually most of them switched to opt-out, the number of exchanges and presumably the usefulness of those exchanges skyrocketed. Opt-in requires a process, it requires time, it requires resources to actually try to collect that consent from the patient. Now there are tools that can make that easier. You can enable the consent process on a, a personal health record if the patient is using a personal health record. But opt, uh, opt in is really hard. We're in complete I, agreement. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so just to again violently agree with him, um, what we did is our PHR when you log in has the consent checkbox as you log in. So in fact, we got you know, 50,000 opt-ins on the first day. I mean, so you are absolutely correct that if you have a arduous manual process, it may take wa a while. To give you some numbers though, at least we've seen about 97% of patients agree to have pretty much their entire record exchanged for every purpose. So the opt-out is a very small number. So we're, we have the same thing, we have an opt-in model. Model. Um, and I've talked about the number of registrars that we've had to educate on the process. We also have a 99.2% opt-in rate. Our opt-in rate is great. The one thing I want to be very cautious about, even if the formation goes to opt-in, is I don't want to allow patients to segregate their data. So I don't want to say, I will share everything but my HIV status, or I'll share everything except for this diagnosis, because I think that gives a skewed view of the charge of the providers who are then viewing that information. And my biggest concern there is that we will have... Okay. It's on. Okay. My biggest concern is that that creates gaps in both the trust of the information. So the provider thinks they're getting the whole picture, but they're really not. And it also then provides you know, safety concerns to me that if we're treating the patient based on what we think is the comprehensive record, but we're missing key things because the patient was too embarrassed or too nervous to share that information, or for whatever reason they wanted to withhold it, then we're not really doing the best we can to provide them with the best care. So she raises this very important point of data segmentation. It's a very hard problem. There is a standard data segmentation for privacy, DS4P, where you could imagine metadata being placed on, oh, this is a note about mental health, this is a note about substance abuse, this is a note about domestic violence, Oh, and patient, you know, you check the box as to what you want sent or not sent. But at least what we have found is when you have unstructured data, it is just devilishly hard to enforce those preferences in a highly segmented way. And so you end up lying to the patients if you tell them that they can segment it. Better. Right. And so what we did, again, it's not perfect. We basically said it's either all or nothing. You know, either we send the corpus of your data with integrity from place to place or we don't because carving it up is just too challenging. Any other comments on that issue? We run, I agree with you, John, on that, but we run into uh, states that will require we withhold information and require us to keep that, whether the patient consents to the full record or not. So we still have to have the awareness of those different regulations. That's something that could be simplified and goes back to our consent discussion about having a universal consent. I think you said that, Matt. Um, which would be helpful because having to manage all those different rules and regulations just causes more overhead and more challenges for us. So isn't that what the government should do then is to unify those requirements so that either so that we're all operating on the same expectation 
So if one or one state right now says HIV is a required element or mental health status is a required element, either they all get rid of it or they all keep that element so that you're not faced with, I even think it like a universal consent. What does that really do for us? Because if we, and I agreed with you, Matt, that I want a standard, I just want it to be opt out <laughs> because I think that you know, if you tell the patient you're not sharing that information, they sign an opt out, but the provider picks up the phone and calls that doctor and they still have a conversation about it, we still shared their information. We just didn't do it electronically. Or they still faxed me a lab report or they still faxed me data in a non-electronic way. So I still know about your condition. So I just don't want to mislead patients by saying an opt out is really an option or even the consent is really an option because patient information is being shared. We share it via medication history right now. We don't require consent for that. And so if I'm treating you for a medic with a medication for your HIV, but I don't send your diagnosis of HIV, I've still told the next provider that Absolutely. you have that. So to me, I think we, we as a nation need to agree on what information gets shared, and hopefully it's all of it, so that we can really do the best thing for the patient in the end. And, I just don't want to mislead people by saying we opt in or we opt out, and then this is what's totally contained in that record. Absolutely agree. And so as we wrap up, just to summarize how crazy consent can be, in the state of Massachusetts, our legislature has made it such that mental health, substance abuse, and HIV-related medications cannot be exchanged by a payer, even with consent. And this was done for a rational reason about 25 years ago. So imagine this. I go to CBS Pharmacy and I get AZT, OxyContin, and Prozac. Now I ask CBS, what meds did I get? And the answer is those three. I ask Blue Cross, none whatsoever. <laughs> and of course, both are providing data feeds to SureScripts. This is crazy. So I think what we've heard from this great panel, and I want to thank you guys, policy around consent, the need for trust, the need for enabling infrastructure, which includes patient identity, record location, provider directory, rationalize some of the standards implementation guides, probably not through government, but through the idea of convening bodies that can rapidly bring us to common decisions about what a standard interpretation should be. Now, of course, as was said, we'll never be done, but I hope we leave you with the thought, today, 2016, it's possible, the vendors and the products exist, so go forward and interoperate. No more information blocking. Thanks very much. Thanks so much. Well done, sir.